if you have your Bible study, understand the Bible for yourself. We are in the chapter on spiritual requirements for Bible study. And last week we said it takes patience and persistence. Patience and persistence. You know that uh, it uh, takes care to, character to study the Bible, but really it's the Bible will produce character as you, it's very, the very way God wants us to be in his word every day, spending time with him. Um, it is, and of course the words, what all the things it's going to tell us, it produces if you have just a little, you know, a little uh, faith like a mustard seed uh, that will get you studying God's word, then he's going to bless that and help that to grow and um, as you are in God's word. So he said it takes patience and persistence to study God's word. We're on page 37. Page 37. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you would bless your word as we come to it tonight. Pray that uh, you would help us uh, to study your word, to be workmen that need not to be ashamed, and uh, to rightly divide thy word. Pray that uh, you would bless the study tonight. And just help us, uh, help us to be better um, students of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, number nine on page 37, understanding the Bible requires concentration. Concentration. Man, oh, you might have to turn your cell phone off if you try while you have, I hope, well, I, I like doing, and I, ne I never, ever thought I would do this, is to read the Bible on my phone. I never thought I would do that. But then I got this uh, King James Version app that you can push any word, and it gives you the definition of that word. It's like, wow, this is great. Not only that is uh, you have a word come into mind, and you say, well, uh, I want cross-references on that. You type the word in and push the button, and it gives you... Now, my uh, the Bible app there doesn't just give you the references. Like right now, we're writing down ref cross-references for our memory verses, um, which is really good. But it, give, it writes out all the verses. It, it gives you the whole verse. So you can go right down through and read every... Not just the reference, but... You're reading every verse, and um, but I like to get my my Bible out with it. Um, this isn't a this is more of a preaching Bible than a study Bible. Doesn't have the cross references, but it has the wide margins. So I will get out this Bible and things that I uh, that has spoken to my heart during my devotions. I might write them in the margins margins of this Bible and underlying stuff. And I hope, I hope uh, even at a young age, like Warren, Charlotte, uh, and, and Todd's learning, he's going to be learning, he's learning to read soon here. Uh, you start reading your Bible, you like something in the Bible? It's like, wow, this is really great. This speaks to my heart. Very carefully and neatly, you underline that in your Bible. And then, you know, several months down the road, you think, we, oh, I, there was a verse that God really spoke to my heart about. Where was that? And you can flip through your Bible. You might not remember, you know, and then, you, oh, there it is. I got it underlined. And you can re-encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, but our point tonight here, uh, we want to look down through and maybe even get to the next point. I'm hoping we're just going to skim these points he gives. He gives 13 suggestions for 
concentration. His introduction talks about how, uh, in Romans 7, talks about we're in this battle, a battle between the, you know, the body and the spirit. And uh, Corey talked about that in Sunday, sc Sunday school this morning. I didn't uh, mention during the Sunday school lesson is I just found this old track. I have my uh, old uh, biblical illustrator commentary that has like 40 or 50 volumes in there. And it was written in 1901. The other day I opened up one of them and there was this old track from like the 50s. It was all yellowed. And it was on Romans 7. I thought this would be interesting. It sure it was more interesting than I thought because the tract was saying that Romans 7 is completely misunderstood. And I got to the end of the tract and I read where it came from. And that's a good thing to do, you know, uh, to Google authors or to... Anyway, it was a holiness movement tract. And it was saying that uh, that was talking about Paul before he was saved. That he had that battle. He had that battle with the flesh before he was saved. And then in chapter 8 where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation uh, to them which are in Christ Jesus. And it goes down through and it gives the principles of victory and uh, yielding your members as instruments unto righteousness. And now... We are not, you know, we don't have those sinful problems we used to have. Well, we might not be continuing in sin, but may I pound your finger and see if some of those sinful thoughts might come back. <laughs> don't tell me that you're, uh, uh, now you're in a holy state. I thought, uh, well, this is an interesting, I didn't expect this. This is an interesting track. And it tells us how we had to rightly divide God's word. And just in this, uh, before he gets into the 13 suggestions for the concentration, he says, we are in a body of flesh. And you know it. I know it. Uh, I wish it was the other way. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but it is a struggle. It is a struggle. It's a battle. And the Bible tells us it's a warfare. The last verse of this uh, introduction before he gives his uh, suggestions, he says, Bible study is a spiritual warfare, and we must do it whatever, we must do whatever it takes to win this war. It is a battle. And you know it. I know it. Uh, so here are 13 suggestions help you concentrate, like I was saying, is uh, lots of things that will distract us. So the first suggestion he gives, a quiet, private place is necessary, and I'm just going to skim down through. You know that uh, that's so true. You've got to get away. Uh, Mothers with young children, let me tell you what, that is not an easy thing. Um, it's, it's hard to get that quiet time, um, especially with babies. They're babies that wake up. They wait, they're the ones getting you up in the first thing in the morning. Um, and... Uh, I've given testimony before. My wife, she was just run ragged with the kids. Uh, you know, the social uh, social welfare workers, or the, the world system that says that stay-at-home mothers are, you know, what's that all about? You know, uh, uh, they're lazy. No. I heard testimony from women that has said, uh, I'm so glad to get back to work, to, to drop my kids off at daycare and get back to work because it was wearing me out. Uh, I'd rather be at work than taking care of the kids. Uh, anyway, we had, as you know, at one time, uh, well, we had four that were five, four, 
two and a half and six months old. Plus my wife had cancer on top of that. Um, just my wife would get up at four, four o'clock in the morning, four thirty in the morning. And I said, sweetie, you need to sleep as much as you can because I mean, you need to get your rest. Well, I got to have my quiet time with the Lord and like get thee behind me, Satan. She never said that to me. <laughs> uh, it's so important. Job said it's more necessary. Uh, it's more important than his necessary food, the word of God. And so... Um, just to say, so important. And sometimes to get a quiet time, you got to come up with a scheme. you got to come up with a plan. Secondly, he says, ask the Lord to help you to keep your mind on his word. You might have worries and fears and, and all the business concerns running through your mind. And just say, Lord, help me to concentrate on your word. Number three, he says, if you are particularly worried about some matter, Cast it upon the Lord. First Peter 5, 7. Love that verse. Uh, to cast all your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Number four, have pen ready as you read. And this, you know, make notes of things the Lord speaks to you about. Number five, remove things from your Bible study area that are distracting. So, like my wife got me this real for Christmas. She got me one of those photo, one of those photo, it flips photos. Uh, what do you call those things? Digital frame. And she put all pictures of the grandkids. And like, there's going to be a couple hundred pictures in there that are just so beautiful. And, um, I can't leave that on while I'm studying because I'm just going to, wow, isn't that a great, oh, wow, wow, wow. They're so beautiful. Uh, and my wife was like, why don't you have the picture frame on? I was like, well, if I'm going to get any studying done, I can't have that on because, like I said, those grandchildren are so beautiful. So, uh, I turn it on now and then, and I just uh, praise God and thank God for those beautiful grandchildren. But you got to remove things from your study area that are distracting. And number six, be careful about using a computer during Bible reading time. And like we said, um, if, if you think a computer is going to speed things up, make this quick and get it over with, then you got the whole, whole wrong idea. If you're thinking that, wow, I can really dig into God's Word and learn, and I cross references and look up words, and then I think that. So it's just be careful with choosing whether you're going to use the computer or not. Uh, number seven, if other projects come to mind, write them down for later. I smile because, man, uh, same thing goes with um, prayer time. Because uh, usually you have your prayer time with your Bible time. But as soon as you start praying about something, there are all these other things that pop into your mind. But some of it's good. I really think as you're praying and you're thinking about, you're praying about people and, you know, friends, loved ones. And you pray, well, the Lord might say, well, send that person a card. You know, write that down. Uh, the Lord might say, well, go visit that person. You know, write that down. I want to go visit that person. Uh, the Lord might say, well, pray about this certain area, this certain concern. You write that down. Because if you don't write those things down, you can't. it takes away from your concentration in your Bible study. So... If other projects come to mind, write them down for later. It might not just be uh, as you study and you get different prayer requests or different um, 
people. You might think an idea is something you should do. Write it down. Uh, number eight at the bottom of the page. If your mind drifts. Your mind would never drift. Mind lights. It's drifting away. Grab it quick. Oh, there it goes. Uh, if your mind drifts, go back and read the passage again. Next page, number nine. Try not to read the Bible when you are tired. Well, depends. Uh, Pastor Henderson told me this one time, too. He said, I like to sit in my recliner at night and just read myself to sleep. Right? And I tell you what, that relaxes you to get your mind on God. Think about God. I know uh, after Heidi took her life, I had to pretty much read. I wanted to read myself to sleep. Uh, just um, And uh, so we know that we're about serious Bible study. But also, there's a side of it. It's just... Uh, Rest in the Lord. Take it in. Thou shalt keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And uh, just keep a serious, uh, sober outlook. Um, but it is true that you want to, um, it says, you know, study when your mind is as fresh as possible. But also, Nothing wrong with uh, reading yourself to sleep. Uh, number 10, put the Bible reading first before you do anything else in the day. Number 11, sometimes it is helpful to read the Bible out loud if you find your mind wandering. We're told that that's what George Washington would do. That they say uh, in the biography I read was that uh, he, would, he would have visitors at his house, and he would excuse himself and go to up to bed. Can you imagine you have visitors at your house? Say, ah, uh, you guys just keep visiting. I'm going to bed now. But that's what he would do. Sounds kind of rude, uh, but that's what he was do. He had a very strict schedule. Uh, and he would say, okay, I'm going up to bed. Good to see you. And then visitors would say they'd hear him up in his room talking. They could hear him talking. And he liked to read the Bible and pray out loud. Wow. Number 12. A large print Bible can also help with concentration. And number 13, be persistent. Goes right with our last, our last Sunday night, patience and persistence. And he says here, the best tip for effective Bible study is to keep on keeping on. Mentions a pastor must teach his people the importance of study time and exhort them to respect that time and help him guard it. Well, we don't have a big church and... Um, I don't have many interruptions on my study time, praise God. But God, just to show how God uh, says the study is so important, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And stressing the second half of this uh, verse, uh, but First Timothy chapter five verse seventeen says, "Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine." So God says it's so important for pastors to labor in the word and the doctrine, laboring in the word and doctrine. So, page 40. Turn over to page 40. 
Uh, number 10. Number 10. Understanding the Bible requires humility. Whenever we study the Bible, we've got to humble ourselves before God's Word. If we're not willing to obey the Bible, then, you know, um, it's just eventually, eventually we're not even going to want to read the Bible. Uh, if we're not willing to obey, what good is it going to do us? Understanding the Bible requires humility. And that's true not just in your devotions, but that's uh, so true in responding to the preaching of God's Word. And I've given testimony many times that when I was starting out in church as a teenager, and just a cool, a cool, popular teenager, um, that when I heard the preacher say that Elvis Presley was not a good man, I'm like, how on earth can he say such a thing? Such a terrible thing. How can he be slandering, slandering Elvis Presley? How can that be? And when I heard the preacher say, uh, you know, men should have short haircuts, and uh, and when the preacher said, dress modestly, um, I had these, what my mother called, they were disco shirts. That's what she called them, disco shirts. Because back then, this is the 70s, disco. I, it, disco was popular, whatever it was. Some little fad music thing that happened. Uh, and my mother got at Martin's, you know, Martin's. Can't pass up a deal at Martin's. My mother got the, she got a, it was this baby blue um, shirt that was like a satin shiny. A satin shiny. And <laughs> did you have one of those? Three or four? <laughs> well, you probably didn't have one. You, you you probably didn't have one like I, like I had, because these had, uh, it was all satin, it was all this baby blue, and then I had also a black one, but they had, uh, jo they had stripes, and between the stripes were all like woven so that they were see-through in between the stripes. And then... My mother also got me, and my mother just didn't know. She had never been taught. She had, I mean, when we started going to church faithfully, she was constantly changing until the day she died. She was growing in the Lord. And for her kids to see their parents growing in the Lord, I don't know if anything can be better than that, for kids to see that their parents love the Lord. But my mother also got me a... Uh, a couple net shirts. Now let's see. This would be. This would be. Um, probably, 1979. I don't know, but I was told at school. This wasn't the Christian school. This was Lawrence. This is my freshman year at Lawrence High School. A teacher came to me, and said. Mitch, that school's not appropriate for school. That school, that that shirt is not appropriate appropriate for school. A public school. And I was like, okay, that's why you find it. Because we're proud. We are just proud. We are born proud, uh, and salvation is all about humbling ourselves before the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he died for us. And then it's like, whatever you say, God, and that attitude's got to 
come through in our Bible study, our Bible study. And uh, you will never understand, like the Bible says, men should have a haircut, uh, short hair. You'll never understand that if you don't humble. It's just, if you don't have humility to say, well, whatever the Lord says, whatever the preacher, he preached on, you know, men are supposed to have short haircuts. I, that's just what you think, and I don't care. And then in the Christian school, uh, one of the Bible studies one day, I was reading, and in 1 Corinthians, it says that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. And I said, like, well, they never said, never said that God said this. If God says this, then I better do it. And for modesty, for modesty, the same, the same thing is that uh, if somebody's proud, they're never going to respond. They're never going to say, well, I really, it usually, usually what happens is people get offended and angry and I'm not, I'm not listening to that. Isn't it interested in first, well, we're right in first Timothy, turn to chapter two, where it's talking about the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, verse nine, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest. God wants you to, uh, um, God wants women to adorn themselves. That's not the problem. What do you, you know, you have here, uh, women will come back. What do you want me to do? Dress in black and no, Proverbs talks about the virtuous woman that has her household cold and scarlet. Yeah, the Puritans didn't even catch up on, they didn't, they didn't pick up on that one. Uh, God loves beautiful colors. And, you know, Jacob made Joseph a coat of many colors. Nothing wrong with colors, but it's, uh, so God says, yes, you adorn yourself, but modesty and also femininity. And, man, today we are seeing the huge mistake the church made in giving in. Oh, it doesn't matter about femininity. doesn't matter. Uh, and a generation of girls grew up and dressing like men and have ended up uh, just a huge wave of masculine men. Mas no, we don't have that. Masculine women. A huge wave. And God said, so it's not just a matter of modesty, it's femininity. And it says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves. In mod we said all that just to get to this word, with shamefacedness. What do you mean shamefacedness? Well, um, the dress reflects the humility. It really, the dress reflects, am I dressing the way God tells me to do with, and with humility, or am I dressing the way I want to dress? And uh, God says it's to dress with humility. Pretty interesting that the most specific passage in all the Bible describing women's dress and it's really uh, not just dress their whole attire uh, look in Isaiah chapter 3 you ever notice this passage in your devotions uh, Isaiah chapter 3 talks about the women in Isaiah's day and it says that in verse 16, the whole, the, it goes all the way from verse 16 to verse 26, talking about these women's dress, and it mentions, they were in the fashion, let me tell you. I think as long as the fashion is modest and feminine, God said, adorn yourself. It is, uh, it's a testimony when you see, 
ladies that are dressed, you know, up to praise God, to bless God. That's a testimony. Uh, I, this, uh, how do I say this? I thought it was this lady years ago um, that I, she had, how do I say this kindly? She, she didn't seem to like, uh, she wasn't very, she wasn't very good looking. Like, uh, I don't know, how, how do I say this? You're not recording this, are you, Holly? Well, <laughs> anyway, just, anyway, uh, she didn't have looks going for her, but she was so modest, and she adorned herself so nicely, because I'm, I mean, there's nothing that it was, this, this is all appropriate, what we're talking about, is just because she also was an old, uh, older woman. And I thought, good thing. Good thing she adorns herself so nicely. Good thing she dresses so modestly, because she didn't have a whole lot going for her. But God, God says, God says, you know, women ought to adorn themselves. Just do it modestly. And as women profess in holiness, you know, uh, be feminine. And that's what God wants. This passage here talking about, man, a lot of these women were in fashion, but it was, it was like, um, it was showy. Where this is all under, we're getting this point. Of, to understand the Bible takes humility. And you think that one of the biggest areas where people say, no, nope, I don't agree with that. I'm not listening to that. Is biblical modesty. And without humility, nobody's ever going to get it. Uh, so this passage in Isaiah chapter 3, the beginning of verse 16, it says, Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. They weren't shamefaced. They were haughty. Uh, and walk with stretched forth necks. The model that, you know, uh, I remember years ago, it was in the news like it was a great thing. Like, this is a great thing. That there was a college student from Liberty University. And Liberty University used to, at one time, be a leader in fundamentalism. Uh, just strong preaching. And uh, started compromising. And I remember years ago, it was in the news like it was supposed to be a good thing that a student from Liberty University won the, I don't know if she won or she was one of the top uh, in the Miss America pageant. I said, that's not something. You know, what the Bible talks about, their glory is in their shame. Their glory is in their shame. They should have been ashamed, ashamed about that. The Miss America pageant? Man, when uh, my family, when I was in high school and my family turned to the Lord, uh, it wasn't long that my mother started saying, that's not right. That's not right. That's not good. That's just, we know. I mean, uh, it's just not right. Uh, anyway, those stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing, mincing, I... That word means, uh, it's like showy steps, showy steps. As they go and make a tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughter of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Uh, God's saying that because of their uh, outward uh, seductive dress, it's going to lead to that kind of life, and he's going to judge them uh, in, in sexual diseases. And it goes down through, and it gives a whole list of all these things they're wearing. Isn't it interesting? God noticed every single little thing they were wearing. God noticed it. Well, I thought God only looked at uh, 
in the in the heart. Doesn't God only look at the heart? Uh, God can see the heart. He knows the heart, but he sees everything else too. And it takes uh, humility. We didn't get very far on this. Understanding the Bible requires humility. And you can stunt your growth. You stunt your growth when it uh, took me, my, my growth was stunting as, as a teenager. Uh, it took me several years to finally say, yeah, I guess Elvis Presley wasn't the Christian role model. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be listening to Kiss and some of this terrible rock music uh, because at first I was just hard. I was hard and my guard was up, and I was a cocky junior high, uh, high school kid. And you can't grow if you don't have humility. And so understanding the Bible requires humility. And it's not just, uh, it, it, I should, it's, it also will involve intellectual humility. Not just the social, um, practical, but intellectual humility. Because think of the Bible doctrines that have got way off because somebody said they knew, they know it all, like the Calvinists. They, they can decipher it all. We got to stop. Man, I went longer and looked at that. We got to stop and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray that we always would come to your word with humility and to accept whatever it tells us and uh, just uh, have humility, uh, your humility in our lives. Uh, you are meek and lowly uh, in, in every area. Help us to have that humility. Help us to humble ourselves, and thank you for your word tonight. Pray that you would help us this week to live for you, to love you, and pray that you'd use our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.